Hi, it's Mario from the Delivery Manager Daily. Uh, get yourself over to the blog, mariosblog.co.uk, and read my latest post on Lean. I've started doing, and I've talked about Lean before, so there's a couple of posts, but I do a talk, and I'm starting to do that talk more and more. So I wanted to kind of capture it so I could look back at how I do it, uh, because the way I present, I think, is, is for this particular subject is, is, is pretty good. Uh, I'm really passionate about Agile, as you know, and Lean is a kind of a subset, both a, a set of tools and techniques and methodologies to really make projects go the way that you want them to. It's a really interesting topic. I'm not an expert, but I did want to tell my story. So go over to the blog, hopefully watch this video too. So you'll go to the um, presentation in a moment. And if you want to leave feedback or get in touch with the conversation with me about Lean and Agile, go to Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, at Mario DC. And don't forget to listen to the Delivery Manager Daily Podcast, wherever you get your podcast software from too. So hopefully uh, that'll be interesting for you and thanks for watching. Right, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, the Delivery Manager Daily. This is the talk uh, that I talk about if you go to mariosblog.co.uk and I think it's the latest post uh, all about Lean. And I've talked about Lean before. There's another blog post that I linked to where I talk about this, but I'm starting to do this talk again and again and again. So uh, what I wanted to do was to kind of walk through it. So I've got it for prosperity and I can point people to it and practice it because I'm doing it more and more. And this is my learning and my journey uh, when it comes to uh, talking about lean. And I'm not an expert. What I am is learning and hopefully uh, over the next few kind of months and hopefully years as I continue this more and more, I'm going to do more lean stuff because it's become an intrinsic way of how I deliver projects. So uh, who's this presentation for? If you're into delivery or you run a product team or you're a technical program manager or anything like that, this talk's probably gonna be useful for you. Um, if you're into agile and not really sure where lean fits in or you want to develop your delivery consciousness, that's gonna be really good too. And you're gonna have a good time kind of going through these 50 slides with me. We'll do it in about 40 minutes. Um, by the end of the talk, if, you're, uh, if you've been listening and I have done my job right, you'll have a core grasp of lean and what lean thinking is. You'll kind of understand where to go next for practical resources and you'll be able to practically implement some lean straight away uh, in your project. So hopefully this will be useful. Big agenda, but we'll whiz through it. So a bit about me, quick introduction. What the f is lean? So we'll quickly talk about its history, where design thinking fits in and what design thinking actually is, practical lean and how to apply it. We'll talk about the notion of expensive decisions, the notion of value and outcome-based thinking, some practical, um, they're the equivalent of agile events in, in Lean, known as Kaizen, and we'll do all the Japanese translations later. Uh, we'll talk about focusing on the customer and then finishing off with some takeaways and some further reading. So hopefully um, you will be able to continue this conversation. A um, little bit about me, got some pictures there. Uh, I think I've still got that wig somewhere. Look at that TV. Um, so... I still am an agile management consultant type person uh, working for a dedicated company now. Uh, I do a podcast on sustainability within delivery teams and also uh, delivery management itself. Uh, I've been an IT manager, an agile consultant, a technical program manager, and I've worked in IT since well, 17, 18, and I've lived throughout the UK and Europe and I've spent some time in the US. In fact, I'm about to go over to the US a couple of weeks from at the time of doing this. So a little bit about me there. Um, in the hour or so I've got for this recording and to put on YouTube, I'm not going to talk through everything because it's just too much and too much in depth, but I want to focus on lean as a set of tools or methods. So doing like toolbox lean, the practical bits you can take and apply just like I do agile and lean as a philosophy. So kind of lean thinking uh, and what that means and how I try and encourage my teams to, to be more lean. Um, this is quite um, virtuous. Uh, or fortuitous, I think is the word I'm looking for there. So a few days before I did this talk again to a bunch of colleagues, uh, I saw this on Twitter um, and it kind of sums up everything I'm going to talk about. Um, if you're an engineer and you are at the mercy of a pro or project manager and you've got a backlog full of stuff, the reality is you could be working on hundreds and hundreds of story points, hundreds and hundreds of tickets, but the reality is the stuff actually worth doing is usually uh, a proportion of that. And that's the whole problem with Agile. Sometimes it's become a bit waterfall and we'll talk about that uh, shortly. I know it's contentious, um, but 
in terms of value, this is a problem, right? Is what you're working on valuable? Do you know? Do you know what value is to you, what it means to you and your clients? And that that kind of meme there summarised it for me. Um, a bit of a history on lean uh, back when um, the world was black and white and folk like Henry uh, J. Ford were rolling out uh, the Model T. Um, factories were geared up to be super efficient and Henry J. Ford pioneered what was the start of automated production line manufacturing. And there was a bit of a, an adage, wasn't there, that you could have the car in any colour as long as it was black. And that's fantastic as long as uh, the market just want that particular car and um, they don't want any new features or you don't need to pivot or adapt to the market. And off the production line came these cars really slickly, efficiently, with little waste. Uh, and Henry J. Ford kind of pioneered that. There are a few problems. Obviously, you can't pivot to market demand. You can't change based on customer appetite. But in terms of efficiency and, and minimizing waste, he kind of kickstarted the notion. And then throughout kind of the 50s, 60s and 70s, kind of post-war Japan, folks in, in Asia Pacific uh, built out this notion of the House of Lean, which was this uh, mindset and, and cultural, almost a paradigm of eliminating waste, but also looking at other efficiencies across everything that you do. And that kind of was born the Toyota production system. And if we bring ourselves right up to today, where we look at uh, automated roboticized batteries and we'll use cars as, as to set the scene. Um, even today, we use things like just-in-time manufacturing to minimize waste, and that has all fallen out of the Toyota production system, making sure that waste is kept to a minimal and operational efficiencies are as good as they can be. The problem with waste is in a physical setting like a factory, you can see it, it's there. It might be unused sheet metal, unused components sitting in a box. Uh, with software engineering teams, it's often digital waste. It might be the JIRA backlog, or it might be old dusty confluence filing cabinets that don't get read or information is out of date. And that's what we're gonna talk about. How do you apply some of this lean thinking into modern software engineering? There's huge amounts more to talk about the history of lean and I've not done it justice there, but that gives you a smattering of where lean came from. And this is, this is the issue, right? You know, teams often are busy doing the do, but actually what I try and encourage uh, teams to do is, well, what's the least amount of work that you have to do to kind of get to the next important thing? And what important is, is, is a question that the teams have to ask themselves. But what we don't want to do is be going from sprint to sprint, just doing stuff because that's just waterfall, just because we're doing it quicker. So lean is about maximizing value. It's not about doing more with less. It's about being really effective with less resource going through this hypothesis driven approach of learning something, a problem and getting to its root cause, building something that might address that problem and then measuring it and using that empiricism to be able to do course direction to make sure that teams are doing the bare minimum that is valuable for what is often the client rather than important for the team. And I'll use some kind of personal anecdotes to help bring this all together. Um, so it's about being able to make informed decisions using data through collection, almost this scientific experimental hypothesis driven approach. And it's avoiding the risk of failure by as early as possible, validating thoughts, hunches and feelings, all valuable things. But what we ideally in business want to back up with data because committing to code is, is an expensive commitment that we want to defer as long as we possibly can. So lean versus agile, kind of where does it fit? So we've talked about a little bit of the history of lean, what we mean about lean in the areas we'll talk about. For me, design thinking is as much as creative as it is um, problem solving and really getting to the nub of what is often a user problem or a user pain point and actually exploring the problem in a scientific way, gathering data, getting feedback and really empathizing with the people experiencing the problem. Design thinking is so much more than just the creative, it's true problem solving. And if you've had the privilege to work with good design thinking teams, uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll feel that too. Lean's all about building the right thing. So taking that uh, data and then understanding what's valuable, what's gonna solve that problem 
and then committing to building that. And Agile is about building the things in the right way. So small increments, no surprises, and being fairly nimble with the way that you uh, develop the product. Because design thinking, it isn't just the creative, right? Um, and I like this um, because it always reminds me that the depth of design thinking is more than just a bit of prototyping in Axure or uh, Balsamic. And it's actually more its root cause analysis. And it's really deep working with users, empathizing with users and understanding what a problem really is. Uh, Tim Brown, CEO of IDEO. Uh, there's a really nice quote that I'll parrot here. Uh, he, he says design thinking, and I think it sums it up really nicely. Um, a human centered approach to innovation that considers the needs of people, the possibilities of technology and the consideration of physics success. I like that because uh, it takes into account all the elements of what is often a, a technology team. You've got the needs of the people up front and addressing, as we said, their issues and really empathizing with them, how you potentially use technology to help solve that problem and the consideration of business success too. So building something has to be within the performance parameters of making money, being profitable, being scalable and being sustainable. So all those things coming together is design thinking. And there's an argument that says design thinking is at the core of every good software engineering project. And we go through these things, right, that all seem quite logical and linear, but often are skipped. Certainly the top kind of two, empathising and defining the problem. Uh, as a new boy at an organisation asking people, so why are we doing this? What's the problem? And I'm met often with a furrowed brow kind of, I'm not sure, you know, and often these bits are skipped because we need to kind of truncate a project timeline or we've got a limited budget. But the problem is the project becomes expensive because we're not validating what we think and therefore we're not deferring decisions. We're going to code straight away and we don't even know if what we're building is correct. So it's really important that we go through that empathizing and definition of what the problem truly is before we start getting onto the more exciting and sexy stuff like ideating and prototyping. And this is the problem, right? And my problem with Agile in management consultancy in particular is it's very quickly become, certainly over the last 12 to 24 months, just a sea of post-it notes. And we get lost. And I've potentially got lost as a, as a fairly experienced delivery manager, just churning through, kind of setting up a backlog, setting up a confluence page with ways of working, some approach to estimation techniques, setting up all the agile events, getting all the team in, setting up a sprint zero, populating the backlog with sprint zero preamble and project hygiene tasks. And before you know it, you've got 100 tickets in the backlog and we've not even really thought about what we're doing for the customer. The end of the first sprint comes and I report to the client, things are going well. We've set up some infrastructure pipelines. We've developed some unit testing frameworks. We've done some internal team documentation on how we're going to work. And the client's like, oh, I'm not sure I care about any of that. That's not really valuable to me. And we'll talk, you know, and just keep that in mind, what value is and means. Uh, some classic kind of tropes. Uh, throughout busy organizations, which I'm sure will all resonate to you. You know, often teams are too busy to get better or too busy to do things different and too busy to improve. But do that at your peril, because that's where you lose significant kind of competitor um, sort of uniqueness and you will lose your market to people, companies, organizations and teams that do spend time on innovation and changing. And of course, you don't need uh, a delivery manager or a TPM to come along and just throw bodies at the problem either. That whole uh, adage of uh, you can now get nine women to deliver a baby in one month. It's cliched, but even today, uh, you know, I have conversations with people and some of the kind of suggested answers are, well, we'll just, we'll just bring some more people in. And that is not the way to speed up the delivery of something often. But there are no shortages though of recipes on how to be agile. And that's, why I got into management consultancy to be able to articulate and cut through some of the noise and to be able to make this resonate with teams and organizations that maybe this isn't their, their kind of DNA, their world. Um, you've probably seen this, um, but it's Deloitte's version of the agile uh, and lean landscape with each one of these points being a methodology, uh, a way of thinking, a practical process or a way of doing things. And my argument with this 
is how are you meant to uh, just, just, you know, get your head around understanding what something li- like lean is because it's saturated within this type of stuff, which I absolutely hate. So this talk is very short and lightweight, but it should hopefully just describe what lean and lean thinking is. Because we all want to get better at what we do. As a delivery manager working with teams, I don't know a team that doesn't want to get better, that doesn't think that it's squeezing the most out of its current performance. And what I try and do is help kind of nudge those marginal gains that collectively uh, make a, a whole big improvement. And using Lean has enabled me to do that for the first time, delivering projects under budget and under time because of a change from kind of classic agile, which had become a bit waterfall, uh, to Lean. So some nuances then. So what do we mean with the difference, the slight difference, almost a bit of an exoskeleton that sits on the top of of what Agile is. It almost distills Agile values. With Agile, you're obviously doing small increments, small batch sizes, delivering quickly, no surprises up front, constantly checking and retrospecting at the end of every sprint. Is this okay? Is this okay? Um, Not a lot of time thinking about vision and value, often you just lurch into the next sprint and to complete a series of sprints. Engineering teams focus on story points. And if you're lucky, you build something because you've baked into the project some type of user empathy, user understanding and problem um, analysis, hopefully. But even then, Agile often doesn't quite hit the mark anymore with a lot of delivery that I've seen over the past 36 months. Whereas with Lean, we focus on increasing speed by understanding what value is and doing the most valuable things first for the client and for the project and for the problem rather than for the team. So I have to put aside my nice neat OCD way of thinking and wanting a nice sprint zero backlog. Engineers might have to put their uh, desire to want to prep straight away to focus in and understanding what the problem is, understanding and empathizing with the users. In this case, if we're building some software, speaking to the users straight away, getting them sitting next to the engineers as it's being built, getting live feedback. It can be really problematic and sometimes not feasible, but often when it comes to crystallizing an idea from thought to actual uh, market leader, lean is absolutely the way to go. And if if you're a product manager in a digital world, thoroughly recommend if not already you start thinking about using lean concepts and techniques to help how you plan your deliveries you see thinking about the outcome and i have had an epiphany with this thinking about outcome completely changes how i plan budget and prioritize stuff and this has had a dramatic impact on the speed of the delivery true speed the handoff is it's more uncomfortable up front and you have to spend time getting everyone into the mindset and trust and commitment of uh, what lean is. Because otherwise you can just be on a project as a delivery manager and your engineering teams are rolling out code and that's great, um, but code doesn't necessarily equate to value and code comes with a cost of ownership, debugging, maintenance, legacy support, et cetera. So you wanna make sure you are building the right thing. And again, it sounds really easy to talk about, but so many times, even in today's modern world, you know, software is just getting rushed out the door and no real thought of whether it's valuable or not. From Jeff Gothel, from a talk that he did on kind of engineering practices and, and efficiency. And I'm kind of parroting this directly because I really like it and it absolutely rings true for me and all the teams that I've worked with for such a long time. You know, you do work in a fixed scope, despite, you know, organisations suggesting that they are agile. You've got that classic iron triangle of scope, uh, budget and time. So what do you do? You move the deadline, you de-scope or remove features and you work 80 hour weeks until the deadline. You burn out and you quit and you can work somewhere else. And that's a real problem. And I see this all the time. And as I go into project after project after project, there are often on the back end, uh, engineers and um, team members that are just, look, you know, we've hit the, the the last deadline, but we're all burnt out. It's not sustainable. And ah, oh. so I think this is a real problem. And again, Lean can help address this. So we're going to talk about mindset thinking of decision and decision commitment and referring decision and the notion of expensive decisions, what we mean by that. You're always moving from doubt to certainty with Lean. In fact, if any thing you take away from this even in life you want to move from doubt to certainty and using 
techniques and tools to be able to give you that certainty rather than just making expensive decisions up front where you haven't quite validated um, your thoughts. CEO and former president of Hyundai Motor America, John Krafsik, sums up the importance of, of kind of implementing lean and, and what that means. To get competitive advantage, that comes from understanding the customer's needs and problems and defining the business process in order to deliver unique value. And you do that through the things we're talking about in this, whether it's empathy within the teams to give them the space to do the right thing, to do valuable things. And that's really the difference between a good engineering team and one that's at the mercy of process. It's not to say you throw process and rigor out the door and agile in part addresses some of that, but often we go from one extreme to the other. And what lean does is crystallize some thoughts and notions and practical things to extract an understanding of problem, hypothesis driven everything to be able to refine and crystallize a potential solution, test that and then build it. But I really like that quote. So it, it kind of resonated with me. So. I stuck it in the deck. And just going back to, you know, my approach to deliveries in the past, and it's like, well, I've created this backlog of stuff. Surely that's helping the engineers and, and the front end developers and the BAs and the, and the QAs and stuff, because we kind of rinse and repeat from project to project. We take our own solutionized approach from our experiences from the past, and we apply that to our existing problems. So I've got 150 tickets in the backlog that you all need to kind of uh, start uh, refining and estimating. And everyone's well, like, hold on, but but Agile, it's about working together as a team and you've already put like 100 tickets in the backlog, you know, what you're doing. And this kind of summarizes that here. So I've, I've, I've changed the customer's pain. It's more rainbow now. Now that might be important to me. It may be that the last time I did this, the customer wanted a rainbow paint scheme, but how does that help the customer? Have we validated that? Do we know? It's really important that the things that we're doing have value and sometimes we don't have the space to do that. We have to work through a process or we have to do what's in the backlog. But especially when we're doing smaller, tighter or greenfield projects, then maybe what we want to do is think about using lean to actually build out what value is. And a good friend of mine and a delivery manager who, if you're watching this, you'll know exactly who you are. When I did this talk a, a year or so ago, said, so what you're saying is that lean is just scrum without the bullshit. And they're kind of absolutely right. For me, lean takes, and my application of lean is to take from agile, just as I have done always, and crystallize some of the core things and distill that within a team operationally from a process perspective. And you can do that, especially with software projects that are starting completely greenfield. And it's a real good way of getting results very, very quickly. Because, you know, as a agileist, uh, I do think agile is the new waterfall. And I do think there are a lot of agile organizations that say they're agile, but still have to work within the iron triangle. And there are environmental parameters that govern that you have to be waterfall. And there is nothing wrong with waterfall. And this is where I like lean, because, again, I've kind of distilled and crystallized what agile is for me and the teams that I work with and that I lead and what lean does and helps and that can work within the parameters of um, a waterfall environment, which there is nothing nothing wrong with. But I think um, there'll be many people that kind of smile, hopefully, when they see that, because I do. I think Agile is, is kind of the new waterfall. So we've talked on the history of Lean then, and we've talked about kind of where it sits within Agile and, and delivering, and we've talked about design thinking and how that's more than just the creative stuff. It's about problem solving. And we've talked about kind of where Lean is in terms of a mindset and where it sits next to Agile. And it's like Agile with a manifesto. Lean has its own kind of foundational objectives and tenets that massively cross over into Agile, but it's important to call some of them out. So we've talked about eliminating waste in a factory setting. That's easier to get your head around because you can physically see waste and no one wants physical waste. You see it, you're reminded of it, and there's a logistical issue of dealing with it. In organizations that deal with technology and software, waste can be e-waste. And it might be, you know, gigabytes of um, Jira tickets with file attachments that have not been looked at, that sit in a backlog that no one really knows whether to close or not. And it sits consuming storage space. No one really knows, you know, how to pick them apart. So they just get left project after project after project. The same with Confluence wikis. You know, how many times have we rocked up to a project 
and there's confluence after confluence after confluence page, but it's all out of date or it's not relevant. And it sits there like a dusty digital filing cabinet. And that is a project in itself, kind of eliminating all that. So we've got to think about waste and creating waste. Building quality in goes without question, but we build quality in by thinking about value from the offset. Creating knowledge, ironically, you know, I talk about not having dusty digital filing cabinets, but actually using wikis and technology that we have as teams to be able to ensure that everyone in the team has an equal level of knowledge rather than one person that you go to who's a subject matter expert on this and, and someone else on this because it creates communication inefficiencies. What I'm not suggesting is Dave, the DevOps engineer, also needs to be a whiz on accounting and our delivery manager has to roll up his sleeves and write code. That's not what I'm saying, but it's about creating a level uh, playing field for access to information to enable people to make decisions that are valuable. And an example is I've worked with an engineering team that we got in front of the client straight away, even down to the minutiae of talking about invoicing and cost and issues with kind of scope and budgetary constraints. And initially, the engineers were a bit puzzled as to why we involved them in that. But actually, as they got an understanding of the CEO and the mission and the vision of what they were trying to build, it completely changed the approach and the way that the product was built because everyone had a true understanding of what the client was trying to achieve rather than it being distilled through a, a program manager or a delivery manager. Delivering quickly, obviously using agile techniques, respecting people culturally. We'll talk about that right at the end, but also again, thinking about how you create that level playing field to enable teams to work in a lean way. Deferring commitment, we're gonna talk about expensive decisions next, but you want to defer commitment as much as you possibly can, which sounds a bit of an oxymoron when it comes to project delivery, but bear with me and we'll come back to that. And then optimizing the whole. So if you do any kind of problem solving or management consultant-esque business analysis, being able to look at a problem from 35,000 feet and looking at the whole thing, is a massively valuable skill. Often we as human beings solutionize based on what we know and what we think we know because we've done it before. So something that's happened to us in the past, we apply that thinking to a situation that we have uh, in front of us. And very often they don't align at all, but as human beings, we can't help ourselves. So there's a real technique to being able to understand a problem. This is where good design thinking uh, comes in and is really important. So it's this notion of five steps of perfection known as kind of D-make, D-M-A-I-C. And just to briefly skim over some of these, some more obvious than others. So we, we talk about using defined thinking to define what a problem is, to be able to describe symptoms and to be able to make the problem understandable to all. Again, as a new person at an organisation, speaking to a team and saying, hey, what, what, what's the problem here? And everyone looks around and says, well, actually, I don't really know. Um, you know, you'd be surprised how often that happens. And if you don't understand what the problem is, how are you doing the right thing to fix it? So, you know, we've talked about measurement and understanding and analysing a problem, being able to collect data based on facts and not just hunches and feelings and gut feel, which are equally important. But we want to do a little bit more than just rely on those, because if we get it wrong, that's an expensive decision. And then structuring the problem by determining kind of root cause analysis and analyzing that data that we've, we've collected and measured. Then working out what the improvement is, whether it's building a product to process change or something similar. And then one of the most important ones for me here is control. And what we mean by that is making sure that whatever it is we do is sustainable and repeatable. So typically we think about process here, but if we make a change to a process, making sure that it's not just one team or one project that can adopt that process, that we, we're impr impr improving, implementing, as the word I was looking for, we're implementing a process that's scalable and sustainable throughout an organization. So if you're a management consultant doing like target operating model design or anything, control is really important. So I got my team kind of thinking and challenging both the client and ourselves through these kind of three overlapping sort of questions. And this, kind of helped us to stay focused on hypothesis driven everything you know do we know the goal do we know what we're trying to achieve do we know why we're trying to achieve it and practically can we do it do we have the physical skills do we have the knowledge and is it something that we can do does the idea have value does it add value to the to the thing that we're trying to solve is it a vanity thing and really sort of challenging 
the, the product manager or the client on, on whether it's a desirable thing for the problem solution or whether it's desirable just because it's a, it's a bit of a vanity thing. And does it make business sense? What it return value? You know, is it a viable thing to do? And kind of constantly checking ourselves as we went through that helped us craft a really, um, a really tight backlog that was based on value going through this hypothesis, validation and execution. Really important. Everything in Lean is through this experimentation approach. So it's really important that we don't forget that. Right, so the truth curve, which is somewhat known, but you may or may not have seen this before. Um, and this is the notion of deferring commitment. And we'll use an example that we've all had an idea at three in the morning that we've lurched from bed and thought, wow, that is a game changer. I'm going to become a millionaire. And it might be a great idea and it might not. So there are a few paths to executing it. And what we can do is we can get straight out of bed. Let's just say we've come up with an idea for a new app and we just so happen to be able to write apps. So we walk into our office and we fire up the MacBook and we start writing code and we quickly get to a point of beta and you launch it. You've not really tested it, but so confident are you in that you've developed this game changing thing to a problem that you're not quite sure exists, but you, you, you're sure that it does and you've experienced it and it might be that you make your millions from it but often what you'll find is that was a really expensive decision because without it being validated you don't get any users you don't get any downloads you don't make any money and often we do this with our clients money we do this with our clients projects and if we act upon our gut and our feelings and our emotion um whilst you need a sprinkling of that for sort of courseway navigation with no data to validate your thoughts um, you just kind of aiming at random points and spending a hell of a lot of money hoping that it goes right. So how can you change that? So it's three in the morning and you get up with this great idea. We'll write it down and talk about it. Maybe talk about you, you, your idea to your family, your friends, people in the pub, actual people that might want to use the thing that you, you're suggesting is going to be built. Maybe you want to create some kind of paper test or prototype it. And you can see that as you move down this process, you go from a really expensive decision to what is often a cheaper decision as you get more validation. And the balance in an engineering team is making sure that you don't defer commitment forever so you never build anything, but it's also about building stuff as cheaply as possible that addresses value. And it may be that you solve one small problem first with a really robust solution and then you build on that. And even though that sounds really common and obvious, it is, Staggering that on a daily basis, I see teams, uh, product managers and technical leads and C-level executives kind of basing all their decisions on that wishful thinking rather than validation because they don't have the time or the budget or it's not in the scope of the project. And as a delivery manager, as an ever becoming more experienced kind of technical program manager, uh, it's been mindful of, well, how much money have you got to make this really expensive decision? And we can apply this to every area of our life, right? But you want to make sure that you have all the data, that you've validated that before you get down to building uh, expensive software. How do you do that? Well, go out and see. We're often at the mercy and guilty of looking through the world through a fogged up gas mask and looking at JIRA tickets, and that is our view of the world. If you're an engineering team led by a project manager like someone like me, often your view of the project or the problem is through a JIRA ticket. Very, very rarely is the harmony between how that ticket is crafted and how it explains not only the issue, but as a whole. And as an engineer, you might be working in silo, doing through some story points in an individual ticket without actually thinking about the whole problem because you might not think you have the scope, you might not think you have the autonomy, my argument is as a good experienced TPM is creating that landscape within a team for everyone to be exposed to the problem, everyone to be exposed to the client and the product manager and going out and seeing. And that's really important. It's how we truly learn and we experience what a problem is. But what if it's wrong? A uh, massive, massive um, piece of feedback that I often got, we're all scared of getting it wrong. And this is where we hide behind process and we hide behind backlogs because it's easier to blame the process if something goes wrong. 
what if it's wrong we don't want to do stuff that's wrong and often we, we're not fortunate enough to work in landscapes and environments where we have the space to make too many mistakes and if we're working in a mission critical environment even more so so what if it's wrong and this was some of the feedback that i had and some of the fear i had from an engineering team when i first started implementing some practical lean so we'll, we'll come back on to that but just some food for thought right here's where i bastardized some japanese so kaizen um, loosely translated to good change or improvement these are the things the practical events techniques and practical tools that you can use um, to achieve lean thinking and that's what kaizen is uh, in the talk that I do, if I do this in person, I'll ask, you know, does anyone know what this picture is and represents? And I always think that this is a really good reminder of simplicity. Um, it looks like what you would find in a classroom, sort of easels with children's paintings on. But what that actually is, is a physical Kanban. And that guy there, I think this is from a Toyota plant. Um, he's moving project cards from right to left and managing working process using Kanban, which is a Kaizen uh, technique in its own right, as well as a tool in, in Agile that we know and love, uh, to be able to keep things visual, to be able to manage work in progress. And I've used practical Kanban physically on whiteboards within open floor teams to be able to create visibility of work and to be able to minimize WIP and to get teams talking and swarming around a central source of, source of truth and we've just got rid of um, like the, the quintessential backlog in Jira that's 300 tickets deep. And actually, we've migrated over to doing Kanban, even for a fairly mission critical, complex project. Sometimes it's about understanding what tools you've got at your disposable to solve a problem. And in this case, Kanban can be really powerful. And as lean thinking comes from um, the Toyota production system and Kanban was an integral part of that, I thought I'd include this old picture here because it's a good reminder. So uh, I want to talk about value streams and what we mean by a value stream. And it's often a technique management consultants do to be able to map out and understand uh, a process. And if we talk about a value stream, what we're often talking about is an action event or trigger that when it's reached its conclusion, you've released value. That value might be a product. It might be the completion of a process. It might be a piece of data. But when we mean value stream, um, that's what we're talking about in this context. Now, um, again, using car analogies, when we think about, for example, the manufacture of a car, we might think about, well, some robots build it in a factory, uh, I buy it from the showroom and I start driving it and that's it. But like everything, there is more that goes on behind the scenes. And this exemplified in this slide is, is the notion of a value stream for manufacturing a car. So we think about the raw goods, the raw materials going into the factory and being coordinated and the logistics of that. The robots manufacturing that car on the assembly line. Then the vehicle will go through some kind of QA and crash test type process and get signed off. And they go onto the back of trucks and the logistics of, you know, um, getting thousands of these cars into the showrooms all up and down the UK. Then you've got the operational complexity of the showroom and then the sales team drafting up contracts to sell the car to you. And then it doesn't stop there. There's the warranty. There's hopefully, you know, you won't have any problem with a new car that you buy in the UK. But <laughs> that's another conversation for another time. But post the warranty, you've obviously got the support and the maintenance and everything else. And that kind of exemplifies that actually standing back and looking at a value stream. This could be a process in this particular example. We're looking at a, a physical kind of manufacturing process, but it could be um, a piece of software being thrown from department to department and, you know, the classic DevOps cycle. And, you know, it's an operational problem now once it's been built and tested and the testing team suffer because they've not been included in the scoping process and don't really know how the software is meant to work in the first place, et cetera, et cetera. So being able to look at a process at a deep level is a real skill and it's part of design thinking. Mapping the value stream, there's a technique and you use visual collaboration tools like Myro. Um, it comes with templates and things. But broadly speaking, thinking about the start of the process, the trigger, 
and then the customer and all the steps. Now, there'll be some when we try and map out a process, we often think about the things that are right in the forefront of our mind. If it's making toast, it's getting bread out of the bag, it's getting butter out of the fridge, it's popping it into the toaster, it's buttering the bread and it's eating the toast. But there are quite a few more things that go into that. There's the, um, and going back to like any kind of office process or to use the toast analogy, there are a number of things that underpin that. There's the going to the supermarket to buy the butter in the first place. There's the refrigerator that keeps the butter cold. There's the fact that the bread's in a bread bin to make sure that the bread doesn't go mouldy and that the toast is plugged in and has an electrical supply to be able to make the toast. So in an office environment with a process, it's not just the, the, the processes that you see in the forefront of your mind, it's all the underpinning systems, tools and technologies that allow that sequential step and step process to continue. But in between all of that, there's consideration of information flowing from point to point and the direction that it flows and the process time, which are equally just important. And a practical example is, you know, if you're losing time on a project and thinking about, well, why, why do once we built a feature, it spends so much time in QA and test, is it that you don't have enough test resources? Is it that you're not writing automated test plans? Is it because you can't write uh, automated test plans because of a technical constraint or limitation or anything like that that contributes to the whole? So when we talk about optimizing the whole, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So if you work in any kind of engineering team, you're a BA, you're a TPM, you're a product manager, this is how you need to be thinking about problems and processes to be able to kind of get the best out of value stream mapping. And it's really important that you understand the value stream to be able to optimize and make more efficient. So applying some bite-sized lean, these are some of the things that I did in a recent project um, and that you can think about. Um, so we got rid of the backlog. I just, you know, it was a noose around the engineering team's neck. I built the backlog. It was all um, written with the best intent, but it was to suit my uh, desire to be uh, organized and wanting to eliminate um, our engineering team having to think, which is a bad idea. And it doesn't matter how smart I am or think I am, you know, not having that co-authored backlog was just a mistake. So the engineers came in and they were already looking at 100 tickets and it already felt like the project had momentum when it didn't. What it had was a load of what's in my head into the backlog because I was suggesting that this is project hygiene stuff that needs to be done. We got rid of the backlog, we used Kanban and that was visually easy to manage WIP and it was visually easy to be able to swarm around. We got rid of all the agile metrics because we didn't really use the backlog. So looking at burn down and velocity charts that frankly, most people, even when they talk through, like they understand what a burn down chart is, they often don't really understand and don't really know how to interpret what they're looking at. They just make a comment on the shape. And even if as agileists and experienced delivery managers, we know what a burn down chart looks like and how you're meant to read it, you can sure bet a client doesn't. Do they care? They absolutely don't. So we got rid of that reporting rather than the value of practical demos and having the client sit in with an unfinished product. Um, to make sure that they got visibility of the product as it was being built. We used automation to kind of eliminate waste. And we talked about sharing information earlier. It was really important that we got the team around with the client to talk about some of the constraints, whether they were budgetary, whether they were kind of long-term vision. And even though to start with, it seemed like a bit of a waste having expensive full stack engineers sitting in meetings, talking about budget over time, that shared knowledge meant that everyone was able to be on a level playing field to make smarter decisions. And that is how we became more lean. So just going back to DMAC then, this is this notion of define, measure, analyze, improve and control. Really, really important. I won't parrot this, you can read this in the recording and you can pause it. But for me, going through this and thinking about DMAC is, is a really structured way of being able to plan your project and shape your project and shape problem solving. And if nothing else, I recommend that you do something similar, if not this. So another Kaizen type event, and it's something intrinsically we're sometimes not very good at as human beings because we don't ask why, because we're nervous to ask why, because we want to feel like we already know, or it's a, oh, it's a bit stupid that you don't know. So the notion of five whys is to be able to drill down into a problem no more than five levels deep, to be able to understand the root cause of a problem, rather than what we do as humans is to quickly and superficially solutionize 
based on our learned experience from the past. That can uh, help, but it can also sometimes hinder. So five whys is a technique that you can use to just interrogate ever so slightly more in depth to just hopefully get to the nub of the problem. If I do this talk in person, what I'll do is ask for someone in the audience to kind of uh, be a, a guinea pig, a volunteer, and I'll posture the scenario that they're responsible for an app and I'm their stakeholder and the app's late. And I will ask the question, why was your app late? And the person might say, well, the app was late because we didn't have enough time to finish it. Now that's a fairly superficial response. So I might say, well, why didn't we have enough time? And then the next response might be, well, we didn't have enough time because we didn't really plan effectively enough. Why didn't we plan effectively? Well, we kind of skipped the planning stage because you as the stakeholder wanted to get to um, a set of features as quickly as possible and you wanted us to start as quickly as possible. So we built something and then we found out that it wasn't right and that caused delays. And why did we do that? Well, you wanted to skip kind of the validation and the hypothesis stage. And fundamentally, that was the root cause of why the app was late. So that kind of five levels deep. Again, you can use Miro. I'm a big fan, but there's some templates that I give away on my blog, marosblog.co.uk, that you can kind of do it. But it's broadly about defining and understanding a problem and drilling into just enough detail using this interrogative technique to be able to get to a root cause. And this is fully part of the design thinking process and responsibility. So don't just think design thinking is getting your paintbrushes out and good BAs and good management consultants. In fact, anyone good within a team should be able to use this technique to be able to understand a problem. So next, a bit of a football pun, and anyone that knows me knows I absolutely know nothing about football. Uh, I would always ask this guy, Marouane Fellain, plays for, I don't know, but catch ball or Hoshin Canry um, is loosely translated into compass management, a direction, Hoshin and Canry administration. Came out of post-war Japan and the idea is that you create a bi-directional feedback loop and create a consensus. And that consensus is about that sharing knowledge. So many times, you know, I work with engineering teams and they're building something or coping with a legacy piece of technology or a legacy backlog. And it's because the thing that's being built or supported has, been, has come from the craft and the vision of C-level executive. And they've pushed out an order, a vision, a manifesto, and everyone in the trenches has been left to kind of do the do. And there's been very little in the way of commitment and bi-directional feedback. So catch ball, and it can be a physical thing if you've ever done kind of PI increment planning within the agile space. You've got you know, hundreds of people in a room over the course of two or three days at a hotel. So you can plan the start of a project in the first few sprints. And you can use a ball to toss between the teams, anyone that's got a question, an issue, a concern. And whilst you've got that ball, everyone listens and values what you say. And when that ball's passed, you are ceremoniously committing to what came out from that, um, that interaction, and what was hopefully a, an agreement. And the idea is that this creates a visual theater of from the top, the boss, the C-level executive, the goals, the vision, the mission, the thing being asked to be done, but giving operational employees and the management teams and everyone in between equal say to create consensus because consensus is gonna be the thing that makes the project ultimately lean. Lack of consensus, is where you have a problem. And if you just think to any project that you're in at the minute, it's often that you have disgruntled people doing things that they don't really want to do because they don't understand. They know that it doesn't make sense. They know that it actively harms the project or they're not really sure of the value. And sometimes you've got good delivery managers that kind of sit in and, and do that kind of top down and down up communication. But if you do things like catch ball periodically or at the retro stage, which is really good, adaptation of a retrospective as an agile event do catch ball um you can create consensus and consensus is really important it's not designed by a committee but consensus and it's giving everyone a voice i appreciate for larger more complex multi-directional up downstream dependency type projects um this may not be um as practical unless you're right at the start but if you do have that opportunity to do something like catch ball and you're not really going to run agile and do PI increment planning, um, this is often a good way to go. And it can go from consensus to crafting a backlog in Kanban and actually building something of value. 
So an hour in, we will finish by these three rules to live by. My equivalent, the equivalent of an Agile manifesto, but for Lean. Out of respect for our customer, we make decisions which bring the most value with minimal waste. So this is always about thinking what we're doing, how it benefits the customer, customer and, and not necessarily us. Out of respect for our employees, we create environments that allow everyone to do their very best work. So making sure that our teams and the environments that we work in are geared up to allow everyone to do things like make mistakes, to be able to experiment and to be able to go through that hypothesis driven notion to make sure all the things are valuable and we're not just paying lip service to lean like we pay lip service to agile and really we're flogging our engineering teams 70 hour week just to churn through story points and out of respect for our co-workers we continuously strive to optimize our processes to allow everyone to deliver the most value they can provide so this is team level responsibility between ourselves to make sure that the things we do, whether it's sharing knowledge, whether it's creating process, making sure that everything we're doing galvanizes and enables the team to do this stuff too. Some links, if you wanna do further learning, there's a few more posts on my blog, uh, all the Kaizen events we've talked about, including Catchball and the history of lean and lean manufacturing and value stream mapping and coaching, coaching canary. Uh, I told you I'd butcher uh, some of these terms and some really good books too. So I really recommend the Lean Playbook by Dan Olson. I've got it around somewhere in my office here. Uh, and those um, Lean Manufacturing and Lean Thinking series of books by Joe Bronson and Francesco Inello, Six Sigma, Five S's and How to Speed Up Your Business. Really good, no matter what role you do. They're quite enjoyable, short, easy to consume uh, books. So I really recommend you put them in your library. Really, really good. That is it for this lean conversation, and I hope you've enjoyed it. That makes sense. I'll use this as a as a reminder for me when I next do this talk too. Um, but I hope that's been useful if you're a delivery manager. And if you want to uh, reach me on Twitter or X at Mario DC or search for the Delivery Manager Daily, um, that'd be good too. <laughs>